While she was pouring forth all her sorrow, Theron, who had waited till the dead of night, was silently drawing near the vault, his oars touching the water lightly. First ashore, he assigned jobs as follows. Four men he sent to keep a lookout, with instructions to kill anyone who came near the place, if possible, and, if not, to give warning of their arrival by an agreed signal. He himself went to the vault with four others. The rest, they were sixteen in all, he told to stay on board with oars poised, so that in an emergency they could quickly pick up the men on shore and row off. When they began to use crowbars and hammers heavily to open the vault, Clarahoe was gripped by a variety of emotions. Fear, joy, grief. Surprise, hope, disbelief. Where is this noise coming from? Is some divinity coming for me? Poor creature, as always happens when people are dying. Or is it not a noise, but a voice, a voice of the gods below calling me to them? It is more likely that it is tomb robbers. There, there is an additional misfortune. Wealth is of no use to a corpse. While these thoughts were still passing through her mind, a robber put his head through and came a little way into the vault. Clarejo, intending to implore his help, threw himself, herself at his knees. He was terrified and jumped back. Shaking with fear, he cried to his fellows, Let's get out of here. There's some sort of spirit on guard in there who won't let us come in. Theron laughed scornfully at him and called him a coward and a debtor than the dead girl. Then he told another man to go in, and when nobody had the courage to do so, he went in himself, holding his sword ready before him. At the gleam of the metal, Clarahoe was afraid she was going to be murdered. She shrank back into the corner of the vault, and from there begged him in a small voice, Have pity on me, whoever you are. I have had no pity from husband or parents. Do not kill me now, you have saved me. Theron took courage, and being an intelligent man, realized the truth of the matter. He stood there thinking. His first idea was to kill the woman. He thought she would get in the way of the whole enterprise. But he very soon thought of the profit he could make, and changed his mind. She too, he said to himself, can be part of the funeral treasure. There's a lot of silver here, and a lot of gold. But the woman's beauty is more valuable than anything here. So he took her by the hand and led her out. And, calling his colleague, he said, there you are, there's a spirit, there's the spirit you were afraid of. A fine brigand you are, scared of a mere woman. Well now, you look after the girl. I want to give her back to her parents. We'll get on with ta taking out what's inside, now that there isn't even the corpse to guard it. When they had filled the ship with loot, Theron told the man who was guarding the woman to stand a little away with her, and when then he brought forward for discussion the question of what to do with her. They had different and opposing views. The first speaker said, Comrades, we came for a different purpose, but what chance has sent us turned out better. Let's take advantage of it. We can have a successful operation without any risk. My proposal is that we leave the funeral offerings where they were and give Clarahoe back to her husband and father. We can say that we were anchored near the tomb, as we always do when fishing, and that when we heard someone calling out, we opened the vault out of humanity to rescue the woman who was shut up in it. Let's make her swear to support everything we say. She'll be glad to, out of gratitude to the benefactors who rescued her. Can you imagine how happy we'll make all Sicily? What rewards we'll get? And at the same time, we'll be doing what we'll be doing will be right in men's eyes and a holy action in the eyes of the gods. 
While he was still speaking, another raised his voice in opposition. You've chosen the wrong moment, you fool. Are you telling us now to act the philosophers? Has breaking into a tomb made us virtuous then? Shall we take pity on her when her own husband didn't but killed her? She's done us no harm, I suppose you'll say. No, but she will do a great deal of harm. Look, first of all, if we give her back to her family, there's no knowing what they will think about the business, and people are bound to guess why we went to the tomb. And even if the woman's parents are prepared to let us off our punishment, the Archons and the Assembly itself will not let off tomb robbers who convict themselves by bringing them their booty. Someone may say that it is more profitable to sell the woman, since she will fetch a high price because of her beauty. But this is dangerous too. Gold can't talk. Silver won't say where we got it. But, or we can make up some story about them. But goods that have eyes and ears and a tongue, who can hide that? And, you know, her beauty isn't human for us to get away with it. Shall we say she's a slave? Who's going to believe that once, she, once he sees her? So let's kill her here and not carry around the means of our own conviction. Many of them agreed with this, but Theron favored neither proposal. You, he said, are inviting danger, and you are losing us our profit. I'll sell the girl rather than kill her. When she's on sale, she'll be too frightened to say anything, and once she's sold, she can accuse us if she likes. We shan't be there, after all. It's a risky life we lead. Come on, get on board, let's sail. It's nearly day already. The ship put to sea and ran splendidly, since they were not struggling against sea and wind, and they had no special course to follow. To their mind, any wind was favorable, was a stern wind. As for Clarahoe, Theron talked soothingly to her, and thought up all sorts of things to try to fool her. She realized her situation, and saw that she had gained nothing by being rescued, but she pretended not to be aware of this and to trust him. She was afraid they might really kill her after all if they thought she was angry. Saying she could not stand the sea, she covered her head and wept. Father, she said, in this very sea you defeated three hundred Athenian warships. A tiny boat has carried off your daughter, and you do nothing to help me. I am being taken off to a foreign land. I must be a slave, I who was born noble. Perhaps it will be an Athenian master who will buy Hamocrates' daughter. How much better it would be for me to lie dead in a tomb. Charius would certainly have been buried with me, as it is. We are parted both in life and in death. While she was bewailing her lot in this fashion, the brigands were sailing past small islands and towns. Because their cargo was not for poor men, they were looking for rich men. While well, they anointed, or they anchored across from Attica, in the shelter of a headland, at a spot where they, there was a spring with plenty of pure water and a lovely meadow. They took, there they took Calerho ashore and told her to refresh her countenance and get some rest from the sea journey because they wanted to preserve her beauty. When they were alone, they debated where to sail to. One of them said, Athens is nearby. It's a big, prosperous city and will find any number of merchants and rich men there. You can sell, see whole populations in Athens, the way you see men in a marketplace. And they all liked the idea of making for Athens. But Theron did not like the inquisitive ways of the town. Look, are you the only people who don't know what busybodies they are in Athens? They're a nation of gossips, and they love lawsuits. There'll be hundreds of nosy parkers in the harbor waiting to know who we are and where we got this cargo we're carrying. Nasty suspicions will seize hold of their malicious minds. And it's the Aeropagus straight away in Athens, and magistrates who are more severe than tyrants. 
we should be more afraid of Athenians than of Syracusans. The place that suits us is Ionia. Why, there are princely fortunes there, pouring down from the Asian continent, and people who love luxury and don't look for trouble. And I expect I'll find a few people I actually know in those parts. They took on water, got provisions from the merchantmen who were in the area, and sailed straight for Miletus. On the third day, they moored in an anchorage, a natural harbor ten miles from town.